Hello, everyone. So this is the third lecture on the topic of early um, or young emerging adulthood. Again, this is the period that stretches from about, uh, early, about the end of adolescence before you get to middle age, which I would be middle age, so that would be the typical, the typical college student would fall into this category. The last lecture ended with a discussion of stress, and in this one we're going to talk about specifically cognitive development. I want to draw your attention to a couple concepts on this in this chapter, um, in particular relative to cognitive. One of them is what's referred to as relativist thinking. So what happens, what's happening during this period of life is, as remember, your brain is developing from the back to the front, and as your for, as your executive function or as your frontal lobe is developing, um, we start to develop the ability to think in more abstract or what's referred to in this case, we're talking about relative or dialectical thinking. So this is what's so fun about higher education is that not until this point has our brain developed so we can like think about the argument, right? Not, we're not necessarily, it's, we've moved from, we've moved from using our, and this is referred to in the next slide where we talk about intellectual, what we, how we use our intellect, right? So when we were younger, we used our intellect to, to use tools or to play with toys or to solve answers in a concrete fashion. Well, in this relativistic, in this dialectic stage of thinking, now we're, uh, we're thinking about the relative nature of arguments and, and it's the sake of the argument that we're that we use our intellect for so we we're learning about how to think right so up until and i may have shared this um in other in other lectures but you know in middle school and high school and elementary school we're we're learning that two plus two equals four and when we get to college we start to our brain our ability to think we can explore the idea that are there other ways that two plus two does two plus, why does two plus two have to equal four? So the point is, is that that's what we mean by relative um, thinking. We've moved past that formal absolute. Dialectical thinking um, is about the argument and logic. And this is why some instructors will set their students up and they'll poll them and they'll ask you like a political question, right? They'll ask you a, a question, do you agree or disagree? And then they'll put, then if they agree, they'll put them on the disagree side, right? So that they can practice that dialectical thinking. And then if you move on to the next slide where it talks about different ways of intellect, what I wanna draw your attention to is during your 20s here, you're using your intellect, your ability to think, um, what you understand for the achieving focus, right? So we're acquiring knowledge so that we can use that in our career path you're taking classes in your major so that you can become a, a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor. All right, moving on to the next one, uh, the next box uh, where we also talk about some different theories about cognitive. Remember, cognitive is thinking. A couple interesting uh, things to point out in this one is this box, and I'm not, in, in this box, um, there's reference to this, uh, what's referred to as the triecta, of theory of intelligence, which says that there that we actually have different kinds of intelligence, right? We have the ability to to problem solve. We have the ability uh, to use our knowledge um, based on our life experience. So we have this experiential intelligence. This is what you know when you say, well, they have more life experience. What you're really talking about is their experiential intellect or the experiential component of their intellect, right? And then the contextual. And what's, what is happening in the early adult brain is you know, they're really good with using this contextual intellect. So you've had a few years on the planet, you have some content knowledge, and your brain is just you're, it's really it's really the fastest it's going to be ever right after I like to say after 25 it's all downhill from there but the ability to use all of this information and rearrange it very quickly is what is so um, what is so strong or so cool about that about that young adult brain right so but also what I want to draw your attention to in this particular box 
is the idea of emotional intelligence. And I am likely to ask you a, qu a question about that on the exam. What is emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is my understanding or your understanding, your understanding of your emotions and responding appropriately to your emotions. So I can identify my emotional state and I can respond appropriately to my emotional state, right? I have some mastery, some understanding of my own emotions. That's part of it. But the other part of emotional intelligence is I understand and recognize emotions in others, in you. Right, so you can not only can you regulate your own and respond to your own, but you can also recognize. So this is, there's a part of empathy here, right? Emotional intelligence is I recognize when someone else is angry or sad and I can respond appropriately to their emotions and I can regulate mine in response to yours. This is what we talk about in higher education called soft skills. Right, soft skills includes emotional intelligence. And there's some interesting um, literature about what's happening when more of our interactions are like this, when more of our interactions are virtual or over text, that we're losing our, our, our emotional intelligence because you can't really regulate, you can't identify someone's emotion necessarily through a screen. And certainly because we're not in real time, we're not able to respond to that. So there's some interesting uh, speculation that people are not as emotionally intelligent as we once were. I kind of have to agree with that. Um, then moving down to the next slide, the, the box here is about higher education. Um, the concept I really want to draw your attention to in this discussion is what's referred to as first year adjustment reaction. I put a post up uh, in this chapter specifically about your first year adjustment reaction. It's interesting to me that it actually has a name. I mean, I've seen it in the classroom over the 20 years and I see it with the young people that I, that I know in my personal life. But this refers to that first year after high school. So, you know, in the traditional setting, you might move into the dorms, you might move out, um, and it's associated with depression, anxiety, loneliness, all of these, and, and it's because this is a radical, rapid readjustment. And if you move out of your house into another town, everything is new, everything, right? So no longer do you have somebody to help you to help you keep track of your sleep wake cycle your parents aren't there to nag you um your the meals you were accustomed to everything is new and this can this is why we talk about stress when we talk about young adulthood because this is sort of the first radical readjustment you know and you know what i have observed is so many young people um where our culture feeds us this model that this is the best year and it's it's a it's a very full year, right? And lots of things are happening, but, but because this can be so stressful, many young people come back home, right? So they go away for a year and then they come home and it wasn't exactly what they thought it was gonna be. It was harder, whatever. So that's what we refer to as um, your first year adjustment reaction. And in the discussion post, I've asked you to sort of recount, was the year difficult for you? And, and I've put my, some of my thoughts in there on that one too. All right, so moving on uh, to personality development. I think I wanna do personality development um, in the next video. So I'm gonna stop this one here. And in the fourth video, we'll talk about some of the research on personality development during young adulthood.